All right, so you've been using Vim now. You're feeling pretty smooth, but you want to step that game up, right? You want to go from that canola oil to the coconut oil. You want to be as smooth and creamy as Vim Diesel. But maybe you're not. Maybe you're still struggling. Maybe you still got the training wheels on. Well, then check out this video. This will be the intro you need to get good. See, the thing is, when you manage a multi-billion dollar startup, you don't have time for a program loading up, okay? You're all Vim, all speed, all coconut oil. Now, here's the thing is that I use Vim professionally. I use it on all my personal projects. I program exclusively with Vim. And you know what that means? So yes, that means I do write Rust in NeoVim. Tell me you're a sex haver without telling me you're a sex haver. All right, so the first thing I wanna start off with is a couple new motions for you. This is gonna really help you move horizontally. And if this does not make your life feel like it's covered and dripping in coconut oil, I don't know what will. Because after this lesson, you should be able to be significantly faster at using Vim motions. So first off, some basic movements. Underscore goes to the beginning, dollar sign goes to the end, zero goes to the beginning character, like the zeroth one. So I can mix those just like we did before. We can do D dollar sign, which will delete from your cursor all the way to the end. But sometimes you wanna be able to move around in the line to a specific character. So let's take a look at this first opening parenthesis right here. If I wanted to jump to it, I could use F, opening parenthesis, F goes forward to the character you save. Let's go back. I can also do T, same character, and this jumps up to, but not on the character you specify. If you wish to repeat it, you can use comma and semicolon. Comma goes backwards, semicolon goes forward. Here's a good example. Let's go like this, F, E. And then as I use semicolon, you can see that I'm walking forward. As I press comma, you can see I walk backwards. But let's go the other direction. If I wanted to jump back to the equal sign, I can press capital F equals, and it'll jump back to the equal sign. Exact same thing with T, capital T equals will jump to the equal sign, but not on top. I've actually found myself using these quite a bit. And I remember that time when I first discovered this, this was just like, it was just such an amazing feel knowing that I can jump through the lines like that. Now, if you remember from the previous video, we did talk about the anatomy of a motion a command can be used along with a count and a motion. So let's jump back here. If F opening squirrely brace jumps to the squirrely brace, that means D F opening parenthesis. I can never say those. It will delete from my character up to and including the opening parenthesis. Let's undo that. Let's walk back. That means D T uh, opening parenthesis will delete up to it, but not including it. My cursor is now on top of it. Same thing with yank. Y T opening parenthesis will yank up in two. And of course, V T opening parenthesis will do the same thing. This, of course, works the other direction. If I go V capital F equal sign, I will jump back and highlight. Same thing with yank as well. Yank capital F equals sign. I just yanked all that and I can paste all of it in. So a big thing to start seeing here is that it always goes command count motion. So just to kind of show you one more thing, I can D two F opening parenthesis. Notice that it deleted past that first one and to the second one. Now I don't often do that level, but you could, you actually could. So just don't forget the anatomy of emotion. A couple more capital I will go to the beginning of the line, but in insert mode. Capital A will go to the end of the line, but in insert mode. Now this should be pretty familiar with how I and A work. It's just the bigger version of it. Lastly, these two are just the most amazing. O will make a new line and go into insert mode, whereas capital O will make a new line above your cursor and then go into insert mode. Yes, I do use Dvorak. That's it for the motions I wanted to show you today because I really just want you to focus moving in that line. Yes, vertical movement will still be a bit of a pain if you haven't done your own research. I promise I will help you next lesson on that. All right, I would like to switch gears and go from talking about some Vim motions to talking about Vim the editor. This way you can have a better understanding as you jump into the Vim editor itself. Now, of course, I've made the assumption that you have looked at my VimRC introduction video. I'm not gonna be talking about the VimRC. I'm not gonna be talking about how to install plugins or how to write small scripts. This will be primarily focused on Vim itself. If you wish to go look at that, go down, hit the subscribe button on your way down, and check the link in the description. All right, so let's just talk about Vim in general. So what you're seeing right now is a buffer. A buffer simply is something that contains text. It can have some various options. Like this one, since it's a view of the file system, I can't just come in here and press O and start editing. Instead, O will take me to a file. Now, this buffer is contained in a window. So let me show you kind of what that means. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open the same window several times. And I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna type in Lua 
vimapi.neovim get current window. And when I print that out, it says 125. I'm going to jump over to the next one and I'm going to do it again. This says 124, 123, 120. You can see each one along the way. But now let me get the buffer instead, right? So there we go. 18, 18, 18. 18. It's all the same buffer because it's actually opening the same place in my file system. So if this was individual files, it would be the same thing. So let's go into server and now I'm going to re-execute the buffer. The buffer is now 10, but the window is still the same window it was in the beginning, 125. If I hop over here, the buffer is still what it was, 18. If I go into server, it also will be 10 now. So do you understand that? A window contains a buffer. A buffer is some representation of the file below it. Or should I say in memory representation. All right, so let's do something cool here to kind of really lay that down. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new file in here. New file.ts. I'm going to save it. And now I'm going to go back to that buffer. Notice that it updated in every single place because these buffers are all the same buffer. So even though I navigated away and came back, that buffer stayed in memory. So this is a really good mental model to have. So when someone says buffer, what they mean is a in-memory representation of something that's like saved on the disk or some sort of temporary item that when you leave it, it'll be gone. It's some sort of visual representation. A window contains a buffer. That way, when I'm right here, I can still switch between a bunch of files because it's a single window that I'm changing out all the different files on or buffers. Now I'm going to make the assumption that you actually have watched that VimRC video and you have installed a couple plugins yourself. You kind of have a general feel. I'm going to give you some basic navigation tips now with Vim. All right, so let's open up Vim. If you were to type in Vim period, what happens is it actually opens up that current directory and shows you it. Now yours will look a little bit different if you have not kind of edited your NetRW experience. Mine looks like this. NetRW allows you to do your basic file system manipulation. So that means I can literally just delete that. Boom, it's gone. You can obviously open up files on here. So I can just open up the tsconfig. There you go. That's a big old tsconfig. And of course you can open up NetRW anytime you want by typing in sex bang. Now don't get too excited Arch users, okay? I, I know you just saw it, you saw it, you wanted it. Now, me personally, I don't like a file tree on the side ever, so I usually open it up with X. I kind of am like a one view monogamous buffer kind of individual. I just go one at a time. Now, as far as navigation of files go, you could use your, you know, your J, your K, walk around in here, walk to the index, open it up, and there we go, we've made it to the file. But that is like pretty dang inefficient. So I have a remap, leader PV, we'll just simply reopen up X. So I wouldn't really use a tree view to be able to do all my navigation. What I actually usually do is I have something called telescope. If you're not familiar with telescope, it was created, handcrafted artisanally by TJ, and now pretty much maintained by Connie, the legend. This allows you to be able to do fuzzy finding and not even just over files. You can do it over Git branches. You can make your own custom fuzzy find list. You can even make your own own custom algorithms for going over items in a list. So think about it as like FCF, but a bit more customizable to the point where FCF is even usable in telescope. And of course, my other way that I use navigation within Vim is with Harpoon. Harpoon effectively is allowing you to have a few files be sticky files, allowing you to just go back there really, really quickly. So if you remember my list, my list had these three on here. So that means if I press a button, I can go to one of the files, another button, I can go to that other file, I can go back to this one, and I can cycle between them really, really fast. I've obviously set up my own remaps that are comfortable for me. You can set up your own. The README is obviously filled the same way as Telescope's README is filled with all the things you need. But really kind of diving into navigation will be very helpful for you. So make sure you spend some time and you find the right plugins for you. A general rule of thumb that I have when it comes to installing plugins is that I find a need. So obviously a clear need is you want a fuzzy finder. Navigating a project with just a tree view would be a nightmare. So I go and I find that thing. And if it doesn't exist, I create that thing. Now, almost always it exists. Fuzzy Finder, Telescope, FCF, you can actually use either or. Harpoon is something I created because I couldn't find what I wanted. And that's the beauty of Vim is that you get to choose what you want to customize versus what you want to go and install. You get to handcraft the shortcuts and what plugins you use to be the environment you want it to be. And I really just find it to be an overall really nice experience. So I hope in this week's lesson, you've taken away two things. A, there's a lot more motions. You can really get fast and B, you need to start thinking about how do you want to customize your Vim experience? How do you want to be able to interact with Git? 
find files, open files. Maybe Harpoon's the thing you want to do. Maybe you want to learn about marks. But either way, there's a lot of knowledge, and hopefully this week you get even faster, even creamier, even smoother than you've ever been. Because the motions that I showed you should make you a lot faster. Now, if you like this series, just hit that subscribe button down below. There's going to be a few more after this that are going to go over some Vim-specific stuff, and of course, some more motions to make you better and creamier at navigating Vim. And again, if you haven't done the VimRC video, go do it because it'll be a lot easier consuming this video series. Thank you for watching. The name is The Primogen.